green constitution, like really environmentally friendly and protecting the environment. Besides that, I know nothing about it. <laughs> I don't know anything about the Montana Constitution. I didn't know we had one. Um, I've heard it's really beautiful that a lot of that um, it's written a lot of, with conservation and stuff in mind. I've never read it or anything, but. Um, It's relatively like protective for like personal rights and keeps the citizen like really, really protected. And it gives so many freedoms that aren't spelled out in the Bill of Rights in the federal constitution. I took Montana history, so I kind of know a little bit about it, but not like a whole bunch. Um, I know it's like my teacher gave out little handbooks of it and it's kind of popular actually. I don't know anything about the Montana Constitution. <laughs> I honestly didn't know we had a Montana Constitution, so nothing. I know nothing about the Montana Constitution. During the late 1960s and early 1970s, Montana experienced a quiet political revolution. Issues like environmental conservation, grassroots democracy, and the quality of Montana life captured Montanans' attention. This revolution was marked by a statewide redistricting, a critical study of the 1889 Constitution, and the convening of a new constitutional convention in 1972. Montana's constitutional convention proved an exercise in populism, in terms of the delegates elected, the body's procedures, and the participation of the public. The draft document that the delegates produced was especially noteworthy for its Declaration of Rights. These statements gave Montanans the right to individual privacy, to participation in governmental processes, and to a clean environment. Voters narrowly approved the final document in 1972. How and why Montanans adopted a new constitution defines the state's late 20th century history. In the late winter of 1972, Time Magazine sent one of their top reporters and bureau chiefs to Helena, Montana. Jesse Birnbaum's assignment, find out what the 41st state in the Union was doing with its constitution. Critic Leslie Fiedler called Montana an inhumanly virginal landscape, shuddered at the atrocious magnificence of the mountains, the illimitable brute fact of the prairies. He was right. Montana is elusive, too vast to comprehend. It almost seems indecent for a land so big to have a population so small. The way Birnbaum saw it, the population may have been small, but it liked to think of itself as an exclusive group, if not hand-selected by God, at least hardened by natural forces. Each resident reflects the Montana character, a cussed inconsistency that some people call rugged individualism. It is a trait bestowed by birthright, and steeped in frontier nostalgia. They say, you're not a Montanan until you've weathered 40 winters. Well, the Constitution is uh, roughly the set of guidelines that uh, the organized state will follow as it sets up its business and, and decides how it will live together as a society. I imagine the most important aspect of having a Constitution for people is a recognition that some kind of government is necessary in order to act together in a civilized fashion to forward the goals and ambitions of each of us. And in doing so, so we want a foundational agreement as to how we will work together, how we will live together. And that foundational agreement is a constitution. It is the most basic law that a society has and a good analogy is to a uh, Trump suit in a game of cards where if there is a conflict between, say, a law passed by 
the legislature or a rule promulgated by an agency and it's in conflict with the Constitution, the Constitution prevails. My passion for it is boundless. I, uh, and the reason I give speeches about it is because I think that people um, don't altogether realize what a treasure they have in their Constitution in Montana. They may not, but other states do. The Montana Constitution is widely regarded as a model state constitution. Among what many consider its outstanding contributions are a stack of sunshine laws that opened up government, a recognition and protection of Native American heritage, and a muscular declaration of rights that outstrips the Federal Bill of Rights, with Montana-style guarantees of privacy, equality, and perhaps most famously and controversially of all, the right to a clean and healthful environment. It was a legal package of rights and provisions that was groundbreaking, lauded by many as progressive, derided by some as economically dooming, but finally approved by the voters, albeit with the slimmest possible margins. The convention brought together a hundred of the best people of grassroots Montana. There were ranchers, farmers, businessmen, three professors, five ministers, 24 attorneys, a beekeeper, a retired FBI agent. Nineteen were women, most of them housewives and educators. What they all had in common was virtually complete ignorance of the art of constitution writing and a somewhat unfounded self-assurance. Have you ever done this before? Uh, no, I'm afraid. I don't think anybody living uh, in Montana has done this before, probably. People that probably could have never got elected to the legislature got elected to this thing. It was probably as well informed a group as you could get together for the purpose of doing something about a constitution. It, it, was, it was a cross-section of Montana. You would see people there who had been worried that, that they wouldn't be able to get their crop in before you know, they had to do this Helena constitutional thing. I envy all of you, and we all look forward to a tremendous job to be accomplished. This is, is a people's document through and through. And we were recognized at the time as being a bunch of populists, and we liked that. <laughs> uh, Republicans and Democrats. And I think the people recognized that, and they had a strong feeling that we were really representing them and not representing special interests. It was reform-minded citizens that pushed for the convention and they were the ones behind limiting participation to people who did not hold public office. As Time magazine saw the event, it was a people's crusade. Some may have been visionaries, some were idealists, others were simply pragmatists. Some were special and probably indispensable. But events of 1972 may have been generous with Montana. The state's voters, perhaps recognizing the need for something special, filled a constitutional prescription for visionaries and pragmatists with a group of extraordinarily ordinary delegates. Among them, a Missoula pharmacist and lawyer. Some have called him the Thomas Jefferson of the convention. He disarmed opposition with humor, but passed the highest numbers of provisions. A 24-year-old graduate student, a widowed mother, who later would be voted the most distinguished delegate. A flamboyant anaconda lawyer and son of Lebanese immigrants, easily recognized by his flashy suits and Elvis Presley-style haircuts and sideburns, he was a towering figure. Chairman of the Critical Bill of Rights Committee, he galvanized his peers with his oratory. A thoughtful, committed president of the League of Women Voters, she was a stalwart figure both in the convention and in the bipartisan effort to get Montana voters to adopt the new constitution and a Yale-trained lawyer from Great Falls. At the convention, he was highly regarded for his intellect and parliamentary skills, but he could also rub people wrong. He was short-tempered, made snap decisions, and at times was abrasive, particularly with the press. He was a complicated man, but he also may have been tailor-made for the Constitution. He was determined to make it succeed. That we are actually representatives of the people of the fine state of Montana. So with that in mind, let's put ourselves to the task of creating the very best constitution that we can get the public in the state of Montana to pass. They were an exceptional group facing exceptional times.
Economically, Montana had coursed through the 20th century in epic bipolar swings. Politics, social trends, and laws mirrored the boom and bust cycles, and at the center of power in the state, a pair of companies dominated. Historians, at least a lot of historians, believe the Anaconda Company and Montana Power controlled the state with the Montana stock growers and cattlemen pretty significant in the, in the mix as well. The legislature was um, pretty much at service to those companies. Most states, uh, like Montana, had a constitution written in the 1800s. Ours was 1889. And the problem was that the people that wrote those constitutions were generally the uh, wealthy. The 1889 constitution was written quickly, in under a month, to enable the Montana territories to achieve statehood. In a large part, it was also formulated by the power establishment in Montana, which in the late 19th and early to mid 20th century meant mining. Uh, I've heard it referred to as the Copper Collar Constitution. In 1972, the new Constitution was also written quickly, in a little under two months. But that was after several years of bipartisan groundwork and preparation. By then, the Copper Collar had loosened. Still, by the time the delegates convened, they sensed they had to move quickly. The convention will be in order. On January 17, 1972, they rolled up their sleeves and went to work, quickly organizing themselves into four procedural and then ten substantive committees that would tackle the biggest issues. All were important, but some of the most galvanizing moments came out of four groups, the Bill of Rights, Legislative, Education and Public Lands, Natural Resources and Agriculture Committees. There were many tough issues, but Leo Graybill Jr. encouraged debate, never cut off discussions, and critically made both Democrats and Republicans co-chairs of committees. As much as possible, the goal was nonpartisanship. The toughest, sometimes most rancorous debates flared in the Natural Resources Committee. The chairwoman, a feisty but soft-spoken former teacher, rancher, and daughter of Italian immigrants, battled to push conservation motions. Strip mining was on the horizon, and I had read about the devastation in Kentucky and the Appalachian region and what poverty those people had. And uh, the uh, thought struck me that Montana, eastern Montana, might end up in the same way, and I was very concerned about it. Why should Montana sink to the common filthiness, filthiness of the other common places? I am not provoked that we might be obligated by law to protect our air, water, land, wildlife, minerals, forests, and other spaces. Day in, day out, her committee defeated her motions. The failures began to echo, seven to two, seven to two, seven to two. On the morning of March 1st, with a packed gallery, the Natural Resources Committee presented their majority report to the convention floor. It was not the kind of report Louise Cross had worked and hoped for. The committee chairwoman cried at her failure but she made an impassioned speech challenging each delegate to decide on the wording for Montana's future environmental policy. George James, a postmaster and former part-time mortician, stood up and moved to add the words, clean and healthful. The proposal was defeated 44 to 40. The conservative majority in the Natural Resources Committee had survived its first challenge, but the battle was not over. It was about to become a full-on convention firefight and much of the fight would be carried by the young. Two months earlier, at the beginning of the Constitutional Convention, Montana historian and delegate Richard Rader wrote in his journal about his frustration with young delegates. He said they were like St. George trying to slay dragons but only coming up with windmills. But by March 1st, impressed with their vigor and determination, at least on this issue, he was on their side. So we scrapped all day on the floor. Yet is not Montana our home? Is not the world our home? Should we not have the right to protect our homes by appropriate legal proceedings against those who would defile it? Throughout the day, moderating versions were proposed, then shot down. In between, the words clean and healthful kept surfacing and just as quickly were defeated. The last proposal by Bob Campbell failed by a resounding 68 to 19. Defeated, Campbell sat down and remembers feeling dazed when a page slipped him a handwritten note. To this day, he's not sure who sent it, but he suspects Leo Graybill, Jr. The note said, 
bring it up again. Campbell stood and tried to say something, but no one seemed to be listening. President Graybill slammed his gavel down twice. The sound echoed through the chambers and suddenly there was silence. Delegate Campbell did not have a prepared speech. For a moment, he felt desperate, but then he decided to use a weapon that had been effective for him in the past, humor. And I had about three minutes, and what I did in the three minutes, I said, look, if you want a clean and healthful environment, put it in the Constitution. If you don't put this in there, and we go home after the convention, and you walk down the street and some little kid said, what do you do about the environment? And you tell him, well, we decided to have one, you know. I said, this little kid will shake his head and walk away. I said, there won't be any more North Dakota jokes anymore. There'll be just one Montana joke, and that'll be, you know, that you put in here that Montana would have an environment. And so uh, I sat down and 30 votes shifted on that North Dakota joke. 30 years later, the wording is no joke. Montanans are guaranteed the right to a clean and healthful environment. And that phrase, clean and healthful, has become a lightning rod. What did it mean to have the right to a clean and healthful environment? Well, to me, it meant the right for a citizen to go to court to protect that environment. The environmental clause was groundbreaking, but there was more, perhaps most significantly, a declaration of explicit rights. And I think that's the heart and soul of the Montana Constitution of 1972, that article is, I think, the, the broadest and most thoughtful in the world. Much of the Declaration of Rights was groundbreaking. It included many that are not specifically granted in the federal constitution, such as a novel individual right to dignity clause that also granted equal protection for women, a provision affording children all the fundamental rights of adults, an unequivocal guarantee of the right of individuals to keep and bear arms, and something else, something also very Western, very Montanan. The right of privacy, for the first time, that was defined in the Constitution as a guaranteed right for all of us. There was debate about Native American rights. Still, some felt more could have been done. We've shuffled these people between the Bill of Rights Committee, the Revenue and Finance Committee, the Education Committee. Well, at, at Two o'clock today, the floor of the convention is going to get the issue. And I hope they answer the needs of the Indians. The convention was totally um, a white man's convention of white women. Um, I looked around one day and I, I was wondering where the Indians were. And I, I thought it was real funny. I walked out the door and there were four Indians sitting there. And I thought, you know, isn't this ironic? You know, they're outside just like they were in the old days, you know, at the trading post. The white men are inside making all the decisions for them, and there they are. The decision the convention did make was to direct the state to make it an educational goal to preserve the cultural integrity of the American Indian. The preservation of cultural integrity. So many shall be in favor of that amendment, please say aye. Aye. Delegate William Burkhart kept a journal throughout the convention and his entry from March 17, 1972 reads, Somehow a tumble of feelings catches in heart and throat as the last hundred years flash by in memory. The deliberate government policies aimed at destroying a culture and its people. How do you put back the spirit of a broken people? It is such an easy thing to sit in this comfortable place and write high-sounding words but somehow our intent genuinely must be day after day to accept those who are different. May the depth of feeling generated by these few words about the integrity of the American Indian be translated into real opportunity for human fulfillment. And let us be grateful for Charles Russell's mighty painting on the wall before us. The people in that vast canvas are proud and secure. Maybe their progeny will be renewed and we with them. One group that was exceptionally well represented at the convention was women. Nineteen were elected to the convention, and perhaps most importantly, many were fresh faces. The oldest was born in the 19th century, Lucille Speer, a former librarian who had written extensively about constitutions. The youngest came with the mettle and tenacity to tackle people and issues, no matter how large or powerful. 
In his journal, historian and delegate Richard Rader marveled how May Nan Robinson studied issues thoroughly and could come to a debate with an instinct for the jugular. Mrs. Robinson. Mr. Peacock, it seems to me that in the Bill of Rights, the Constitution of the United States, there are quite a few metaphysical things, such as liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty means personal uh, liberty, and uh, that has a rather clear meaning, certainly much more clear than a high quality environment. I would suggest that what is liberty to one person is not necessarily liberty to another. Are there other questions? Perhaps most importantly, it would be May Nan Robinson's collaboration with Bob Campbell that would be particularly memorable. On a bitter cold January evening, the two young delegates set to work on the draft of a sentence that would eventually hold the promise of the entire Constitution. We, the people of Montana, the 55 word to preamble. For the quiet beauty of our state. After 56 days, when everybody finally was satisfied that we had discussed everything that should be in a constitution, there was a roll call. All 100 delegates walked up in single file and signed the constitution. I tell you right here and now, that touched the hearts of all of us because there was a very small minority that was opposed to some of the provisions. And we all waited, hoping, praying, they would sign the final document. They all walked up and they signed their document and we all left our convention site us with a great deal of pride and love and friendship for one another. Lucille Spear, District 18. Mr. President, there be no further business concerning the drafting of the proposed constitution and our draft being completed and signed. I move that the Constitution Convention at this hour, 12 o'clock noon, this day, March 24, 1972, be adjourned, sign a die. So many as shall be in favor of the motion to adjourn, sign a die, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. It's so ordered.